In this video, we're going to take a look at the history of hockey helmets, from the early days right up to modern times. In the early days of hockey, not many people wore helmets, and there weren't a lot of companies making head protection, and the ones that were didn't have the most protective designs. The person that is credited for wearing the first helmet in the NHL is George Owen of the Boston Bruins in 1928, when he wore a leather football helmet. Several of Owen's teammates were known to wear helmets as well. But even before this, it is known that players in other leagues would occasionally wear a leather football helmet in a game for head protection. But the earliest documented example that I could find of a helmet in hockey was from Ernie Moose Johnson, who can be seen wearing a leather football helmet in this picture from 1915. Back in the NHL, after George Owen, it was Owen's teammate, Bruins defenseman Eddie Shore, who began to be known for wearing a helmet starting in 1933, after an incident in a game that ended Ace Bailey's career due to a head injury. The helmet that Shore wore was actually designed by his Bruins coach at the time, Art Ross, and one of the first to be designed specifically for hockey. But even with these examples, wearing a helmet at all was rare for hockey players of this time. One of the early companies making helmets was a leather company originally known as General Leather Goods of Toronto. In addition to leather hockey helmets, they made ski gear and other leather hockey products like gloves and protective pads. They were bought by Jack Cooper and Cecil John Weeks in the late 1940s and renamed the company Cooper Weeks. They made leather hockey helmets and stood out by incorporating colored leather, like on this SK-1 model helmet. Helmet designs did not change much until 1955. Then, a Swedish hockey superstar named Sven Tumba Johansson came up with and designed what is considered the first hockey helmet made of plastic. The Spaps helmet became somewhat popular in Sweden and other parts of Europe, and eventually found its way into North America, where it shared a bit of popularity. While the pros still for the most part shunned the use of helmets, Parents of kids playing hockey love the idea of additional protection for their kids. Another Swedish company, Jofa, started making plastic helmets for hockey starting in 1963. North American hockey manufacturers started to take notice and also began making helmets from plastic materials. Since the norm at this time was to play without a helmet, companies worked on designing a helmet that would be as light and comfortable as possible. The Cooper SK-10 helmet was one such example which had a similar design to some of the leather helmets of the time, only with plastic overlaying a thin foam layer that rested against the head. The next big release from Cooper was the Cooper SK-100. This design was known for its lightweight and comfort. This helmet is still popular among hurling players to this day. New units of this classic helmet of the 60s are still produced and can be bought brand new, primarily targeted at the hurling market. But even these lightweight helmets could not attract the attention of many NHL players. In 1968, NHL player Bill Masterton was hit with a powerful check by Ron Harris that caused Masterton to land on his head. The injury from the hit would eventually take Masterton's life, as he died in the hospital several days later. He is the only player in the NHL to die as a direct result of injuries suffered during a game. The tragedy hit the hockey world hard and caused a number of players to begin wearing helmets. Stan Mikita was one player who, prior to the tragedy, had not worn a helmet, who started wearing one afterwards. This is the Northland helmet that Mikita and some other players wore. But even after the tragedy, most players chose not to wear a helmet. For example, even on Bill Masterton's North Stars, only six players chose to wear a helmet after his passing, and this was a league high. The Cooper SK-120 and SK-200 were nearly identical to the SK-100, but Cooper did eventually come out with the SK-300, which was more protective than the prior helmets. However, it was also known to be less comfortable and had a reputation for being an ugly helmet. Cooper also marketed these early helmet designs to the growing skateboarding market and made special versions with skateboarding in mind in an attempt to widen helmet adoption. While most players in the NHL were not wearing helmets, some international tournaments began requiring that every player wear a helmet or goalie mask. So goalies that did not want to wear a full and cumbersome fiberglass mask had no alternative but to wear a helmet at the very least. In 1971, Swedish goaltender Kurt Larsson played in a tournament wearing just a helmet. In 1972, he added a barely there mask to his Jofa helmet. Also in 1972, Soviet goalie Vladislav Tretiak wore a Jofa helmet with a cage and eventually moved on to wearing the latest Cooper helmet of the time, a Cooper SK-600 with a Cooper HM-30 cage. 
This combination was well ahead of its time and set the stage for many goalies afterward. The Cooper SK600 was a solid helmet, made from plastic by Cooper Canada. In addition to being the helmet of choice by Vladislav Tretiak, it was also a top pick for skaters that chose to wear a helmet. Another popular model was the CCM Pro Standard Helmet, which really set the design standard for CCM helmets to come. But many skaters of the 70s also chose to wear ultra lightweight helmets, if they were going to wear one at all. One player who stood out from his choice of helmet was Butch Gorin, who chose to wear the Swedish Spaps helmet from the 1950s that he had worn growing up in Winnipeg. Goring explained that the Spaps helmet was a very popular helmet where he grew up in cold Winnipeg because it was small enough that it could fit under a hoodie so that you could skate outside in the freezing cold Winnipeg weather but still be protected. It wasn't until the start of the 1979-80 season that the NHL finally decided to institute a rule requiring helmet use. But to prevent a revolt amongst players that were set in their ways, the NHL added a grandfather clause so that the rule only applied to players signing their first contract after the start of the 1979-80 season. This meant that it was decision time for many players going into hockey at this time. Were they going to go in without a helmet or wear a helmet? And if they chose to wear a helmet, what model should they pick? A barely there helmet or a protective helmet? Wayne Gretzky explained that when he picked his Yofa VM-235 helmet, the helmet he wore his whole career, that he was being told by some players that he shouldn't wear a helmet at all, but settled on wearing the lightweight Yofa VM-235 helmet, even though it was found to be lacking protection. In fact, the Yofa-235 at one point was classified as a utility helmet to be used for activities like rafting or broomball. The Canadian Standards Association found that the helmet exposed players to at least seven times the risk for serious brain injury versus a certified helmet. But plenty of players who wanted to be like Wayne still picked it up to use for hockey. Safety advocates tried to put pressure on Gretzky to change his helmet to set a better example for kids and rec players. But Gretzky said that he's used the same helmet since entering the NHL in 1979 because it's the most comfortable and provides the most mobility. He continued, I do not, however, recommend that this type of helmet be used by amateur hockey players, especially youngsters. Players who are looking for a more protective choice could go with the newly designed Winwell helmet, like the one Gretzky's teammate Mark Messier wore. The Winwell helmet was probably the most protective helmet at this time. The design was eventually bought by Cooper and became the SK2000. It was this design that was used in the 1982 movie Tron to give the actors a futuristic look with a little bit of neon accents added to it. The helmet eventually became the choice helmet for goalies wearing a helmet cage combo as well. Some of the other popular helmets through the 80s into the 90s included the Yofa 366, the Cooper HH3000, and the CCM HT2. The Yofa 366 was a larger helmet worn by players like Mario Lemieux and Timu Solani. Mario had a habit of scratching out the three, so it just said 66 on his. But even this helmet faced challenges for recreation players that wanted to wear the same gear as their heroes. By this time, some amateur leagues would not allow the skimpy helmets for rec players anymore and required that only certified helmets get used. The Yofa 366 did not get certification due to its lack of ear protection. So Yofa released a version called the 390, which was the same basic helmet with built-in ear protection so that the helmet could get certified. This also meant that favorites like Gretzky's Yofa VM-235 was banned in many leagues, with some retailers adding stickers to the helmet warning consumers that it was not protective enough for hockey play. When Michel Goulet crashed his head into the boards in March of 1994, he was wearing a Yofa 235 model helmet and got a severe concussion and ended his career. The CCM HT2 took design notes from earlier CCM helmets, but was refined for more protection. The CCM helmet was a certified helmet, meaning any rec player wanting to look like their NHL heroes could do so as long as they left the ear caps in. It was probably the most popular helmet for a while in the NHL and has been used in the NHL as recently as 2013 by Sheldon Surrey. The Cooper HH3000 was a design that set the standard for future helmets by Cooper, and eventually Bauer, who bought Cooper. The legendary Bauer 4500 was based on this design, and even the Bauer helmets of today are heavily influenced by the Cooper HH3000. It too was a certified helmet. By the start of the 90s, the players that were grandfathered into not needing to wear a helmet were diminishing in numbers. By 1993, there were only six players playing without a helmet. And in 1997, Craig McTavish became the last player to play a game without a helmet when he retired at the end of the season. 
Through the 90s and 2000s, the designs of hockey helmets changed a bit, and the names of the companies changed around a bit as different mergers and acquisitions were done of the major hockey companies. Cooper was bought by Bauer, and Bauer was bought by Nike for a short stint before spinning them off into an independent brand again. Yofa was bought by Reebok in 2004, as was Coho and CCM. The Yofa brand was phased out in favor of CCM. In 2009, there were some interesting innovations being experimented with beyond a few trivial design changes. Marc Messier, who had always worn one of the biggest helmets when he entered the league, had been partnering with a company named Cascade several years earlier that was really putting research into reducing concussions in hockey. They started with a prototype that Mark wore in a Legends game in early 2009, which eventually became the Cascade M11 helmet, the first helmet designed with new innovations to reduce concussions in decades. The M11 helmet was designed with many of the innovations that had been recently put into football helmets to reduce CTE. A retail version of the helmet went for sale in late 2009. In 2012, Bauer Hockey bought Cascade Sports. In 2013, the NHL mandated that all players now need to wear a visor. Like it did before with helmets, it offered a grandfather clause that allowed players that already played in the league without a visor to continue playing without a visor. The first visor can probably be traced back to 1964, when Ken Clay wrapped plexiglass around the helmet and glued it in place after getting hit in the eye with a stick. Prior to the eye injury, Clay did not wear a helmet at all. Clay never made it to the big leagues. However, Greg Neald, who was drafted by the Sabres in 1975, did wear a visor. Two years prior to being drafted, he too was hit with a stick in the eye. And he actually lost his eye. After that, he began playing with a visor. Despite being drafted into the NHL, he was never allowed to play a game in the NHL, since there's a rule that requires players to have good vision in both eyes. Other visually impaired players, like Willie O'Ree, hid their vision issues to avoid being excluded by this rule. While Glenn Neald never got a chance to play in the NHL, he did end up playing in the WHA, the NHL's competitor in the 70s for the Toronto Toros. Today, there are less than 10 players still playing in the NHL that have been grandfathered into not needing to submit to the 2013 mandatory visor rule. In 2015, Virginia Tech, which had previously done tests for football helmets, began running tests on hockey helmets and the initial reports were not good, with the top-rated helmet only receiving 3 out of 5 stars. This spurred hockey manufacturers to scramble to improve their helmets, so they would score better on the test. Bauer began integrating the Cascade technology into their other helmets, as well as making their own improvements to the helmets. Other manufacturers started from scratch and began designing helmets that would stand up to the test from Virginia Tech. Today, there are multiple helmets across multiple manufacturers that have all received five-star ratings from the Virginia Tech tests. So what does the future hold for hockey helmets? While no one can see into the future, some have suggested that the future of helmets will be smart helmets, which will be equipped with sensors that monitor impact forces and can detect potential concussions. I hope you enjoyed this history of hockey helmets. If you did, consider liking this video and subscribing for more videos like these. And consider visiting the Sport Antic t-shirt shop for hockey helmet related designs like these.